I'm DB, a.k.a. Danielle Bezalow, and I'll be your host for the next six episodes of this podcast and beyond. Sex. Birth control. Bondage, domination, sadism, and masochism. Everyone took the condoms, blew them up in the hallway. Conversations about STI and safer sex did not happen. My first time I saw a condom, I was 20 years old. Never do anything that doesn't feel right to you. Otherwise, you're not consenting. I don't even know about a penis's anatomy. I want to be someone who talks more about it openly to degrossify it. So there we were. <laughs> Starting a sex ed club. <laughs> Welcome to Sex Ed with DB, an intersectional feminist podcast for folks who want to hear real stories from five Bay Area voices as we try to revolutionize the way we talk about sex. You thought our last episode was the last one? JK, this is our bonus episode. So, hi Ella, hi Imani. Hi. Hello. Welcome to the bonus episode of Sex Ed with DB. How's it going? Good, how are you? I'm great. Happy to have you both here. If both of you could introduce yourselves and say a little bit about your identities and just who you are and like why you're here, that would be great. Okay. My name is Ella. I'm 18 years old. I just graduated from an art school. I am a queer Jewish woman and I'm super passionate about sex ed reform. And that's part of the reason that I'm here. And me and Imani have both worked hard at our school to get them to change things. I'm Imani, and I also just graduated from an art school. I'm a queer, mixed-race woman, and I'm also really passionate about changing sex ed reform. And, yeah, I'm really excited about what me and Ella have done together. Great. Let's talk about that. What have you done together? What? How are you both involved with that, um, or how were you involved at your art school? Well... It started with, in seventh grade, so me and Imani both went to our school for middle school and high school, and we had this kind of sex ed course in seventh grade, and, and like, it was, it was just, it was a, it felt like a failure (laughs) for most people. It was disappointing. It was very disappointing. We were all really excited going into it. Um, So freshman year, we were supposed to have sex ed again, and our teacher kind of was just like, ah. I don't think we have time. Yeah. And we saw this play put on by Kaiser called Secrets. Do you remember mm-hmm. that? It was kind of like fear mongering. Yeah. It kind of felt like, don't I don't know. Sex. It's like award winning or whatever, but like basically this whole friend group gets HIV. Yeah. And that's like what the play is about. What the fuck? <laughs> the whole friend group just ends up with HIV. I mean, like, it's they like this, all... <laughs> they just all did, did, like, one of them shot up and, like, one of them, like, I don't know. It was just like, here, these are all the ways that you can get HIV, and here are all these people who got them in all the ways. And, like, wow. <laughs> and they're all friends. And, so it's yeah, like, don't all... do drugs, don't have sex, don't right. do anything. Exactly. It was really scary. And my friend had pierced my ears, and, like, they were, like, home piercings. Like, that's a way. And so I was just oh, freaking shit. out. And this, and I went up to one of the educators, and I told her, I was like, my friend pierced my ears. And she was like, you should get tested. <laughs> and actually, you don't have blood vessels in your ears, so, like, you can't get HIV from, like, Oh, you then know. how can, so how can she you just bleed wouldn't... when when you get a piercing? I've definitely it's, it's like you bleed but like you don't have veins or something Mm. like you can i don't know i looked it up and she was wrong she was wrong wrong. because it's just cartilage i mean you bleed but it's just cartilage and um so it was like i think sophomore year i tried to start a condom locker at my school because i heard about another place that did condom lockers and is that like where everyone knows the code and then like people could there's go no in. code it's there's no just code. like just you open. just open it and you just get, take condoms. what you want nice. i went to planned parenthood and i grabbed a bag of condoms and i grabbed all the pamphlets and the people at planned parenthood were like rock on that's so cool because we don't have like a nurse mm-hmm. at our school and we don't have condoms and i was just kind of like that sucks like we should because like almost yeah. every other school i've heard of has resources even some even have birth control yeah like berkeley high they have so many different birth controls that you can literally just get at school which is like such a stark difference from our school which is just i guess under resourced but yeah the condom locker didn't really work out it's a small school people found out about it right away liked it everyone took the condoms blew them up in the hallway you know the whole the whole shebang as children do exactly (laughs) so it didn't really work out but i did have a conversation with the administration afterwards and also imani 
I think, Imani, you must have known that I did that or something Mm -hmm. because you approached me. Also, you read my article. I wrote an article about the way sex ed went for me and people seemed to like it at my school. They were like, yeah, that's, that's, that's how I felt too. And is that how you and Imani became friends? Can you speak to that, Imani? Um, I had known that when I heard that Ella had started the locker and then when I known that you had joined rap, I was like, oh, maybe she'd want to partner with me because I don't think I can do it alone. What's but, RAP? Um, relationship Abuse Prevention Program. Okay, so can you talk a little bit about what the program is and um, what you do for the program? For the program, it was... It was like a semester. Yes, basically a semester of us being taught about sex, about intersectionality, race, gender, identities, society, laws. For me, it felt like learning the real world (laughs) yeah like being exposed to the world for the first time the truth Mm -hmm. (laughs) and like how all those things kind of tie into abusive relationships and like why that can abuse how relationships aren't just abusive out of nowhere yeah there's always some sort of reason some sort of step in society that affects people's like abilities to be in relationships yeah for sure So you learned about all these things and how they kind of were interconnected. Mm -hmm. Um, And then what, how did you take that information and help other students with that? What was that process like? It was really interesting because people really don't talk about abusive relationships a lot. So like having some of the conversations that we did have when we, we took the information and went on as educators, it was like, I was like, like kind of reverted back to like before I knew everything and like, it, we de- like I definitely think I ran into some people who were just like didn't really they just didn't have the knowledge that I had about it and yeah. that's why I was educate like trying to teach them about it but it was just kind of it was interesting I think too like once we had learned once we had taken the sex ed portion in um rap like I felt so comfortable after like they had made me feel so comfortable to be like oh I can talk to this about mm-hmm. other people Imani and, had the idea of us starting a sex ed club together. So we started a sex ed club. <laughs> so there we were, starting a sex ed club. It was on Wednesdays at lunch, and we had, like, a couple people. Not too many people came in each time, but a lot of people that, like, surprised me to, a lot. Yeah. Like, I was, like, excited. There were more numbers each time. I think it was surprising to me because I was... I mean, we talked about sex and sex education, but we did talk a lot about relationship abuse, too, Mm -hmm. which probably hasn't at all been taught with sex ed to many schools. Do you have any, like, facts and statistics, like, at the forefront of your mind about relationship abuse that, like, you would want our listeners to know? Um, Maybe something they hadn't known before? I don't know about, like, statistics, but I feel like a lot of people who go to rap go in having kind of a scary realization of either, like, oh, wow, I've been in an abusive relationship or I've been abusive. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the most important things that I learned is not to blame either side, but to kind of, it's more important to understand why it happens than to put blame on people and kind of demonize people. There's no way for abusive relationships to stop unless we humanize everyone involved in them and, like, just relearn But I think the most important thing I, like, took from it was always asking why. Knowing that asking why is an important thing to ask. And that... What do you mean by that? Asking why in what context? Why things are the way they are. Mm, Like challenging the status quo. Like once you realize your behaviors, wondering why do I act that way? Or why does that person act that way? And then why is society the way it is? Why does society make us act that way? Mm -hmm. Why did the world make the society (laughs) and it just gets bigger bigger. (laughs) until you just explosion (laughs) let's change topics a little bit i want to hear about another topic that we hit on in all of our episodes this season was stis safe sex and feeling good um can you both speak to your experience about learning about stis Mm -hmm. where do you get that information um what like comes to mind when you hear stis and safe sex Definitely when I first started learning about it, it was like fear-based and very uninformative and unhelpful. It wasn't really until rap that someone just like sat down and was like, here are some actual facts about STIs. Like in seventh grade, when we had that sex ed course, 
we looked at pictures on a slideshow of herpes. It was like, ooh, look at the STI yeah. on the screen. Look how like, gross it looks it, and it, deadly. Like, you don't want that on you. Like, it's like, okay, well, that doesn't really talk like that doesn't really give me much help. Like, yeah. And so it wasn't until rap that someone was actually like, here's what you can get when you use a condom anyways. Here's what you can get without using a condom. Here's what's actually like curable. Here's what's actually treatable. It, it was all just like, you don't want this. You don't want this. Like, you don't want this, you know, before. I think they treated it too as talking about it as talking about any other disease or any other infection you'd have, which is important because it took away like the fear, like the stigma of getting any sort of any type of disease or infection. It goes in your body and then you take medicine and you're okay. (laughs) You're so soft-spoken. I feel like I want to hear you read me a bedtime story um, in the least creepy way. I'm totally hearing what you're saying. I'm wondering as young people so you're like the youngest people who we're we're featuring on this show and i'm and you're like the age range of like the questions that we've asked to other people are like if you can go back in time like what's one we thing are you, back in time. yeah you're there you're like <laughs> our back in time yeah. um which is very cool because now that like you know you're just leaving this like high school experience behind very slowly i'm wondering if you could you know go back to your school in the fall, given, you know, all the information that you have, how would you teach sex ed differently? How would you want to teach STIs? How would you want to talk about feeling good in sexual experiences? I think I would definitely just want to make sure there's no fear based around the conversation. I would probably share how common STDs and STIs are, share the importance of preventing them and just for your own health, not not because you don't want to be that one person who gets that one thing, but because you want to take care of yourself and you want to take care of your partner or partners. And I'd also talk about consent for sure with talking about STIs and STDs. I would just definitely not stop at sex equals potentially pregnant or potentially having an STI. I wouldn't stop there, you know, and that's kind of what it felt like. It just kind of stopped there. It was like, here's the actual biological stuff, but if you do this now, you're in for some trouble. Mm -hmm. You know, I would provide resources. If I wasn't able to actually provide, like, condoms, I would definitely provide um, resources for where you can get them. And I just, uh, pretty much to echo Imani, I would definitely want to talk about healthy relationships because it just seems like, so bizarre that that's not talked about I mean I don't even know if that would necessarily have to go with sex ed just like relationships or healthy relationships are really important to talk to young people about because I think if people learned what it actually looks like to be in an unhealthy relationship things would be very different because we just don't talk about we just don't talk about that which seems crazy now that I have talked about it like it's like why don't we like why isn't it standardized right I have thought the same exact thing like you know how in classes like math and science are mandatory PE is mandatory but it's like why aren't we learning how to be like healthy human beings to socialize like the way in which is healthy um, including STIs including you know all of these things um, consent all all of these topics yeah Um, I totally agree I feel like in elementary school there were like these weird videos we watched about like social norms but like why don't they have that for like why isn't that a continued thing do you remember those like weird little videos where you, of like kids bullying each other yeah where it was like stop this is not think okay. <laughs> yeah <laughs> i feel like they need to have older people versions of those totally. or just like not even just videos just like conversations i, mean, I think <laughs> if they did then more people would be aware yeah and that's not what people necessarily want to people to be aware yeah you know? and i think abuse is almost kind of like what it's like the word abuse is kind of like a, I forget the name, but what to call it, but it's like a trigger word or something. Mm-hmm. Not trigger word, but people hear like abuse and they kind of like shut down and don't really want to talk about it, but it doesn't have to be a scary conversation. I think rap definitely helped me realize that we're all somewhat or have been abusive in relationships. Not that it's normal, but it's like you're human. Right. And dealing with them is like, it's okay to deal with it and mm-hmm. to talk about it. It's not doesn't deem you like a horrible human.
So before, I want to kind of move on to our next topic, which is about um, polyamory and monogamy and everything in between. And before, I noticed that you didn't say like, oh, it's you want to be good to your partner. You said, or partners. Mm-hmm. And I want to know how in the rap program you discuss different types of relationships and what those relationships mean to each of you. Hmm. I have never been in a polyamorous relationship. I think our society definitely doesn't... It When we look at relationships in society, it's obviously the man and the woman, and that's what we celebrate and what we tell kids that they have to mirror. So I think talking about it in rap, it was like... It was just good. It was like really comforting knowing like you want something like that that doesn't make you weird doesn't make you a bad person Mm -hmm. but it's totally normal actually while I was doing rap I was in this like really long-term relationship and we decided to be in an open relationship and I was like nervous because I had had some problems with being jealous but I also wanted to do the open relationship so I actually talked to Aaron and Mauro about how to navigate that and Aaron lent me this book called The Ethical Slut. I've heard of it. I haven't read it yet. I haven't either. Okay. <laughs> cool, cool, cool. <laughs> um, so, but he yeah. <laughs> but um, I, I had a really great conversation with them about it. And I think, like, for me with open relationships or po- polyamorous relationships or what have you, it's just, like, like, very, very open and honest communication is super important. And also just laying out boundaries at the beginning. Because, like, there are so many different ways you can go about an open relationship. And, like, the best thing you can do is lay out the kind of ground rules beforehand. Mm-hmm. And also just to Your be safe. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And not only boundaries in the beginning, but it's kind of this, like, continual conversation. Like, mm-hmm. if other people... You know, if, if you're if a partner wants to create a new boundary, then you have to have that conversation before that boundary is crossed and erased. Right. We are now going to be talking a little bit about consent and rape culture. Just coming out of high school, I'm sure there are a lot of things that are happening where and even, you know, forever in people's lives not just in high school for sure but I think it maybe starts in high school where you start realizing kind of like what rape culture is and like how it's so prevalent in our American society um can you talk a little bit about like what rape culture is to you and how you both personally combat it rape culture is basically like the taking away someone's body from themselves like taking away someone's autonomy like disrespect basically i don't know to put it like very simply and i don't know how i combat it right now (laughs) i don't i mean i guess i was thinking about the other i was just thinking about the other day how like it starts so young at at our school in middle school i was talking about this to my friend the other day there was this thing in sixth grade called slap ass fridays where there were like boys um at our school would just like come up and like slap girls asses like really hard without them knowing and I felt like it was big enough throughout the school that the teachers probably knew about it and I'm surprised they didn't I was I kind of realized this just the other day I was like why did the teachers not do anything about that totally I approached a teacher about it and they laughed really that teacher was a male really that fucking sucks and like you still remember that like, you're going to remember that. Like, exactly. that was I that said, teacher's... there's this thing Ugh. called Slap Ass Friday, and these boys are hitting my butt. <laughs> He's like, oh, ha, ha, ha. Fuck. That <laughs> sucks. Like, yeah. Oh, middle school. But also, I remember oh, when I was in sixth grade hearing that, like, male teachers were distracted by things we were wearing. Yeah. And, like, Ugh. I was in sixth grade what when I was wearing fuck? this... I was wearing this skirt in sixth grade. And I was given sweatpants from the lost and found because it was like too short or something. I was in sixth grade. I was like, well, what does that even mean? Like, yeah. what, do you, what do you mean it's too What are you implying? Yeah, like, like I think I too, like, it, like going back to our sex ed, they, one teacher came in and separated boys and girls and they talked only to the girls in the class and was like, this is what you can wear and this is why it's unacceptable not to wear certain things but that was a part of our sex ed 
Our teacher read us a slam poem about why we should, like in seventh grade, one of our teachers read us a slam poem about being modest and covering up and like not, it was very twisted. Damn. That is all encompassing of rape culture. So my understanding of rape culture is kind of this like norm that we've accepted as a society that's like this sexist thing um, where mostly towards, towards women and absolutely towards trans people um, and also gender nonconforming people where people, like you said, don't have ownership over their own mind and body, basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that fucking sucks. Um, yeah. And you would think, you know, that like teachers, the teacher who separated the boys from the girls would actually just focus on the boys and be like, you don't rape people. You don't touch people without asking. You don't blah, blah, blah. You don't police a woman's body. Like, why, you know, like, why do you think that's not in the curriculum? Uh, <laughs> no one has the answers. This is just a question. Why the fuck further... isn't it in the curriculum? I don't know. It, to me, that just, like, further perpetuates all of the system we have and, like, keeping males dominant. I think not allowing them to hear no. Yeah. Just being like, yeah, that's okay. That's how it's supposed to be. And women are supposed to be the ones just giving you Mm -hmm. their bodies. Mm. I also think part of the reason it's not in the curriculum is because then older people will have to take responsibility for the things they put in place for us. Like, Mm -hmm. they'll have to be like, oh, like, this problem didn't start with you all. It it started with with us. us. I mean, it didn't start with them either. It's always, I mean, it's just, It's, it's an ongoing history, historical issue, but like. I also think they don't want to, older people just don't want to think about younger people having sex in any way. They don't want to think about young people raping each other either. Yeah. Mm. Back to consent. And that is totally, you know, a part of this conversation. You two, as young people, how in, I think rap was like this really specific, amazing program that Mm -hmm. kind of was all encompassing and teaching all of these topics, including consent. Um, but say your friends who weren't a part of this program, how did they learn about consent and why it's important and if it's important at all? I think that if anything, I learned about consent after it being an issue, not before. Like it had to have been an issue for me to be like, oh, I didn't say yes to that. And that's what that means. I'm like, That created some sort of issue, but nobody said before, like, this is what this is, and if this happens, like, you have to agree to it. Mm -hmm. That's a thing that has to happen. I don't think anybody told me that. I totally agree, because I, like, learned about, like, rape and stuff before I ever actually, like, felt like I was assaulted, and, like, a lot of the time, even if you do feel like you're well-educated about consent it's unclear when it's happening, like, Mm -hmm. that that's what's happening to you. Even if you feel like you're well-educated about the signs and, like, even if you, like, you just, you might not even realize that that happened to you until, like, way later. Mm. Because a lot of the time with rape, like, while it's happening, it's, it's unclear to you that it's happening, even if you're educated about it. I think, too, because, like, in the movies... There's always, if they cover a rape scene, it's always very dramatic and very, like, this is what it looks like. And if it doesn't look like that, it's confusing. Yeah. It's, like... It can be more, like, co- it's, covert mm-hmm. and, like, and manipulative. Emotional. So you and can like, feel emotionally, like... Yeah, exactly. It's not necessarily, like, a physical stronghold. It's an emotional stronghold, yeah. too. Mm. Which can be blocked, and then you can, like, that, you can process that. It takes forever sometimes. Yeah, and that's another reason I just saw not to like skip ahead for your question but like about like dealing with the law like I feel like that's part of the reason why it's so hard to convict a rapist because sometimes you don't even realize you were raped until it's too late to get a rape kit and it's just it's never that easy it's not it's not necessarily it's not made easy for victims it's totally for people who are you know it's always been easier for the perpetrator Mm -hmm. notoriously Yeah, well, I guess my last question on this topic is, like, what do you want, like, say there are, like, young women your age who are listening to this, even young women my age, you know, like, how do you want them to feel in control of their choices? Like, what would you tell them about consent? I think I would say that 
there's so many things in our society telling us that we don't have an option and that we don't have a choice, but that you still do. And you were born a human and you have a choice and you have control over the things that you do. Like, Mm -hmm. no matter who's telling you, you don't. Or even though it's really easy to feel that way when there's so much oppression, (laughs) but that you do have a choice and you're allowed to say no. Absolutely. I think that it's most important that you feel good and like sometimes you want to think that you feel good when you don't, but to be in touch with yourself, if you don't feel good, it's okay to admit to yourself that something doesn't feel good. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's okay to say, hey, I don't feel good, let's stop. It's just, it's, I think it's just most important that you feel good. And also knowing your boundaries, knowing what makes you feel good and knowing like who you feel good around, knowing yourself. Mm -hmm. And also having someone to talk to, like opening up, you'd be surprised how supportive people are. Because a lot of the time, like even if you're, again, like even if you're educated about it, it's hard not to like feel, like blame yourself and like make yourself feel bad and be hard on yourself. But there is going to be someone who you can talk to who can sort of release that guilt for you, who's going to be like, hey, it's not your fault. So we're going to delve into the next topic. We have a couple more. The next topic is about gender and sexuality being on a spectrum. Um, So both of you I identify as queer women. Can you expand on what that means to each of you? I, like, knew I was queer before I ever even, like, had any experience with a girl. And, like, I don't think you have to, you have to try it to know it. Like, I don't <laughs> think that that's true. I kind of just, like, I think I always knew, but I was, like, in denial about it until I was, like, a freshman. That's when I was, like, okay, yeah, okay, come on now. <laughs> Be honest with yourself. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I think that's the same for me, except probably until, like, junior year. Because I I think I've always been, like, or at least had the belief that we should just be attracted to everything that's on the earth, (laughs) (laughs) every human possible, and still was in denial, like, still was, like, held by society of, like, no, that's not me. Like, Mm. it's cool, but not me. (laughs) And then I was like, it's me. (laughs) I'm super queer. So what's the difference um, for you both? between the word queer and say the word bisexual or say the word lesbian like why is that word empowering or why do you want to use that compared to those other terms when I like first kind of like realized that I liked girls I didn't want to call myself bisexual I was like that doesn't that still feels wrong like and then I I feel like I I feel like the word pansexual best describes me but I don't Can you define necess- that word? Pansexual it means, like, you're just attracted to people. Mm-hmm. You just like people. Um, it doesn't... It's it, Bisexual kind of implies a binary. Um, but I still don't even like to use the word pansexual. Like, I don't... I don't want to be one of those people that's like, oh, I hate labels. But, like, I just don't feel the need to put a word on, like, who and what I'm attracted to. Like... I'm just attracted to who I'm attracted to. And queer is kind of just a nice, all-encompassing word that... It's an umbrella term, and I just... It's it's nice to just have an umbrella term. Also gives you room to grow if you feel like you need that. Because you're not, like... There's just not a label. You're not bound to something. Mm. You're like, this can change. Or it cannot. Or, like, it goes... It's just... And for, for people like me, like, I feel like... And especially for our listeners, because they're... On our panel of people, we have a lot of queer people who identify as queer. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's like four out of six of us, which is like an overwhelming majority, basically, which is great. Um, But I think like, you know, when I was talking about some of these terms to like my dad and my brother, like they just like have no idea, like not because they're not interested, but just because like this these topics aren't necessarily geared towards cisgendered men. And we've defined cisgender um, in our other episodes. So I think it's helpful when we define these terms and Mm -hmm. kind of try to make it so people understand, you know. But for people, even for me, the word queer is is just hard for me because there's no box. And like, I think people are just so used to putting people in boxes Um, and for our listeners who like are also okay with that word and accepting of people who identify that way how else would you kind of like explain it to them 
that like you don't want to be put in a box like queer can be this word where like it's fluid and it's changing and it 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 could mean that you like you know both genders or all genders or it could mean that you only like one gender you know so can you just speak a little bit more to like maybe people who don't really get that word yet because I don't know, I really don't know the answer, full disclosure. So I'm just curious, like, as people who identify as that word, and I'm sure you've heard people be like, I don't get it. Like, what does that mean? Um, people understand, like, I think most people understand the fluidity of, like, ourselves and how people always talk about, like, oh, we're always changing. Yeah, we're always changing. Like, That's yep. what you're supposed to do. Yeah, and, like, that's, I don't know what how to finish my sentence I hear that I think that's a helpful start of like maybe because like every other part of our lives is not put in a box like why should our exactly our gender or our sexual orientation be put in a box exactly Mm -hmm. I think too like there's not a lot of things you're born and then other people put you in a box automatically so being able to be like here I don't have one it's like for me it feels empowering and feels closest to what feels comfortable for me so for some people I think it's empowering to identify a certain way and then for some people it's empowering to be like I don't have to do that (laughs) yeah or like I don't know yet maybe yeah. yeah it's almost like queerness is like if if the world was more of a blank slate and like if we didn't have. kind of push people to two sides like queerness is just kind of like sitting in the middle and being okay with it and just being a person mm-hmm. awesome great and we're gonna move on now to our final topic which is uh kink and flirting The first thing I want to bring up is um, you two are kind of growing up in this like forever digital age that we have and that's like really present in dating and like in Tinder and in Bumble and whatever the fuck else people are using. Um, Can you talk a little bit about if you experience online dating at all and what that's like or what that was like in high school? I downloaded Tinder once. And then I think I had like a couple conversations and then I just kept deleting the app. Not into it. Because it got so, for me it was just really frustrating. I'm Like I'm a really emotional person. So like at times when I was like, oh, I kind of want to, you know. I don't even think I would look on, I was looking on Tinder for relationships. But for other things I was like, this is a good app. But even (laughs) then, there's just so many people that like, not seeing them and it being over the phone makes so many not o things not okay things okay mm. for people to say. So for me, I was just like, I don't want to have to deal with this. Do you think maybe they saw it like as flirting, but it was like really aggressive and like non consensual in your mm-hmm. point of view? Yeah, I think two people like would just go on and say, just do things not being serious, just like for a reaction yeah like be like oh you're hot or like you got big tits or like ask some sort of one time someone was like you remind me of oatmeal and i love oatmeal what like, the fuck things like that and then sent me a gif of oatmeal and i was like <laughs> or just to... like really like to it like sit on my face yeah <laughs> like, yeah just like Wow. You just got to it. No foreplay. Not, just like, let's do it yeah, right now. Exactly. One time. Yeah, because I have Tinder too. I mean, not anymore, but I, I have some, I've had some Tinder experiences. Yeah. What but, were you going to say, Molly? I was going to share a story about my mom and I decided that was inappropriate. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm sure. My mom's stories. I'm, I'm sure, sure she, she yeah, yeah, that. I'm sure she likes that. <laughs> um, okay, so... So I'm hearing that, like, for you two, Tinder and, like, online dating, not your thing. I don't know. It's what you make of it. Like, yeah. I I had – I really like meeting new people. And so, like, sometimes I would try to use Tinder to just meet new people. And I ended up actually meeting, like, some really cool people and just hanging out with them. And – but then also there's the other side of it that, for me, kind of felt like – I would get all these messages. There's way more guys on Tinder than girls. Mm-hmm. And, like, 
I would just get all these messages and I would, they would be like instant validation, but also like I didn't earn it, if that makes any sense. So it's like, oh, I didn't have to do anything. You're just like looking at my picture and like telling me things, yeah. you know? So yeah. I don't know. I, de- I de- deleted it recently because I'm just kind of like, nah. <laughs> Never I mind. I think it's hard to, to know that there's so many other ways to make connections with people. There's so many ways we could be meeting people. Or just, like, we ignore each other when we walk down the street. Right, but then But we need an Tinder app to date people, so it's confusing. Totally. Yeah, like, why aren't people just, like, more friendly? Yeah. (laughs) Which brings me to, like, the point of this conversation, which is, like, when you are in, in person with people, like, what are your, like, best practices of flirting? Like, what are, like, the ways in which you like to flirt with other people to, like... (laughs) To let them know, like, I'm interested, I think you're attractive, like, I want to take this somewhere else. My favorite thing is eye contact, charged eye contact. That's, like, the words can't describe how awesome that is. We're both, have done theater, too. Yeah. That's probably why. (laughs) (laughs) We know the the tools. Yeah. (laughs) Honestly, that's my favorite. When you, like, share a look with someone. Mm. And you kind of just, there's, like, vibrations in the look. Magnetic. Yeah, exactly. Okay. That's um, my favorite way to flirt. Just, like, eyes. I think I do the googly eyes also a lot. And <laughs> I'm pretty flirtatious vocab. Like, I'll be pretty forward with someone. I'll be like, you're really hot. I really like you. I don't know. I'm yeah. pretty forward. Okay. I don't even have to flirt. I'm just... <laughs> you're like, let's just do this right here now. <laughs> um, are people usually, like... Have there been, like, different times where people have been like, oh, yeah, I really like that? Or have people responded like, oh, I'm not really into that? Like, how how does that, like, affect your flirting practices? I guess it's kind of hard to say, like, how, like, one person's liking or disliking of something affects my fr- flirting practices because you kind of just have to feel, li- feel it out with every person you're trying to flirt with. It's just going to be a different dynamic every time, you know? Mm-hmm. I've never been in a situation yet where a partner has said they're uncomfortable with something happening oh that's great so I wouldn't, I know. <laughs> yeah, 10 I for 10 <laughs> <laughs> so but i think you would obviously just stop if it made them uncomfortable i wish it was and that obvious <laughs> i wish people really knew that it was that obvious you where obviously <laughs> yes if you're listening and you make anyone uncomfortable just how what you're doing and then they'll slowly become more comfortable even yeah. if like there's a tiny part of you that thinks they're uncomfortable like ask them yeah seriously like is it making you uncomfortable when i do this yeah yeah um And that goes with fucking everything, right? Like, even if you're super comfortable with your partner and, like, you have been with them for a long time, like, even if they're doing something, flirting, touching, anything that's making you uncomfortable, like, like you said before, like, you have a choice. You have the Mm -hmm. right to say, like, hey, that's making me uncomfortable and, like, I want to talk about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's hard to remember that for people when they're in a relationship because then they feel guilty and they're like, oh, this is what this person expects from me. But, like... People shouldn't expect things from you. Like, you're your own person, even if you're in a relationship. You're not like a, you know, just because you've given someone something before doesn't mean you have to give it to them again. Yeah. Yeah. No (laughs) contract. We didn't sign shit. (laughs) Um, Great. Is there any other thing that you want to talk about? This is kind of like the end where you both kind of get to say your piece to you know we have no idea how many listeners we're gonna have maybe like it's 10 maybe it's my mom like 12 times maybe it's like 100 (laughs) but however many people are listening is there anything really important that you want them to hear i would say if after listening this you're more aware of something don't just ignore it Mm. and realize that like being aware of as many things that we need to be aware of in our society is like hard And it's scary, but we deserve to be aware. And we deserve to have basic human rights. Communication seems hard and scary, but you're going to feel a lot better if you're just open and honest and keeping in communication with everyone in your life. So, like, if you listened to this and you're like, hmm, I'm concerned about this, and you feel like you want to talk to someone about it, like, don't be afraid to talk to them about it and bring it up to them. 
and you'll probably just feel better as soon as you start talking about it. It's like, it's only scary until you actually just start talking. Mm -hmm. And then it might still be scary, and Sometimes that's okay. saying it out loud is just the hardest part. Yeah. Saying things out loud. Yeah. We are very lucky that on this show we've had such amazing, outspoken, brilliant, kind souls, including you two. So I want to say a huge thank you to Ella and Imani for joining us today. Thank um, you. Yeah, and uh, we look forward to hopefully having a second season of Sex Ed with DB. So make sure you listen in for that. Yay! <laughs> Thanks for listening to Sex Ed with DB. If you want to engage with more of our sex ed content, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check us out on our website, sexedwithdb.tumblr.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at sexedwithdb at gmail.com for questions, comments, and suggestions for our episodes to come. Our creator, host, and producer is Danielle Bezalow, a.k.a. DB. Our content writers and editors are Danielle Bezalow, Aaron Steinfeld, and Rachel Upton. Our graphic illustrator is Jessica Lynn. Our social media and marketing lead is Kat Lestufka. Our sound editor for this episode is Lauren Schechter. The title of our intro music is So Low by Art of Escapism. And our outro music is by my stepdad, Bill Gant. Thank you to our featured voices and our listeners. Tune in next time. <laughs>